Paul Rosenblum is a bookkeeper, not an accountant or a CPA. Although the information in this podcast comes from professionals, it's meant to give you enough knowledge about these subjects to have a meaningful dialogue with your tax preparer about bookkeeping and taxes. Hello again, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. I'm Paul Rosenblum. Today, I wanted to talk about audits by the IRS and what you can do to diminish the chance of being audited, and if you are, what you can do to make it an easier day at the IRS offices. By the end of this episode, you'll have the tools to cut down the probability of being audited if it does happen, and have your tax preparer go to the IRS and have you come out of the audit without owing any additional money. One of the first things that auditors look at is the 1099s that were sent out and how that matches to your books. If there's a vendor who is on the 1099 list in the books but wasn't sent a 1099 for that tax year, the auditor will automatically disallow those payments to that vendor as tax-deductible expenses for your company. So if there's a $10,000 payment that you made to an LLC service company, which would be eligible for a 1099 for that tax year, and it's a deduction in your books, but no 1099 was issued, the auditor would disallow $10,000 expense from your books. Your profit would go up by $10,000, and there would be an additional tax that you'd owe to the IRS and the state. Another situation that falls into the category of 1099s is a vendor who you've paid before you ever received the W-9 information form from that vendor. If the name of that vendor is John Smith, for example, and you wrote a check or sent to Zelle or other electronic payment to John Smith, the individual, and later, only after you receive the W-9 form from John, you find out that the legal name of his company is really John Smith, Inc. or John Smith, LLC. If audited, the IRS agent would disallow those payments. Since John Smith is a corporation or an LLC, an electronic payment or a check made out to John Smith the individual and not John Smith Inc. or John Smith LLC can't be deposited into his LLC or corporate bank account, the IRS would disallow those deductions for you since the payment was made to John personally and not to his corporation or LLC, which could mean that John wasn't reporting that income on his tax return. This could lead to John Smith getting audited by the IRS or the state in which he lives. I've heard about an audit where that is exactly what happened. A paper check was written out to an individual in 2020, corrected to the individual's corporate name in 2021, and after the auditor saw the 2021 paper check made out correctly to the corporation, even though they could have disallowed the 2020 payment, they did not. So auditors are human beings too. They aren't out to get you. They just want to keep you honest. The IRS does say that before you pay anyone for a service, you should get a W-9 form to see if they are eligible for a 1099 or not. You are allowed to send 1099s to a corporation, by the way, but not required to. If you use a credit card to pay an LLC, then you also don't have to send out a 1099. The credit card company or the bank will do that for you. If, however, you are using PayPal, friends or family, and not the business edition of PayPal, then you would be required to create your own 1099s and send them out. One of the things that you or your bookkeeper can do at the end of the year before the books and 1099s are finalized 
is to try and get a W-9 form from every vendor that's listed in the books to be eligible for a 1099 for that tax year. Most bookkeeping software has a report that you can run which show all the vendors eligible for 1099s and the information if entered or not entered from a W-9 form. The vendors who you can't get W-9s from, your bookkeeper can adjust to a personal expense. Yes, you will lose that deduction for the business, but if you are audited for something else on the tax return, at least your 1099s will match your books exactly, and you won't have the agent disallow any 1099 eligible deductions. Another interesting thing, which is more specific to QuickBooks Desktop or QuickBooks Online or QBO, is an account which can become part of audits on the chart of accounts called undeposited funds. Many bookkeepers don't use this account. However, I use it as much as I possibly can. Undeposited funds is an account in the chart of accounts which is for payments received from customers but not yet either deposited in the bank or not yet cleared the bank account. For one example, if it's December 29th and a payment from a client is received in the form of a check for $20,000, in the books, you need to show that invoice is paid so that you don't send them another request to pay it yet again. So when you receive a payment in QuickBooks, undeposited funds is an asset account as a sort of escrow account. In this example, the payment was received on December 29th. It goes into undeposited funds. Then the office closed until January 3rd of the next calendar year for the holidays. If you go to the bank on the first banking day of the next year and deposit that check in the books, that value is then deducted from the asset of undeposited funds and added to your bank account. In other words, deposited funds. At the end of the full transaction, undeposited funds will be a zero value. But in the example that I'm giving, as of December 31st, the $20,000 is showing up as undeposited funds, and on January 3rd, the same $20,000 is then added to the bank account as a deposit in the accounting system and in reality. If an accountant or a tax preparer misses the undeposited funds, which does show up on the balance sheet, and doesn't include it in the income on, on the tax return, and it's caught during an audit, that could be a bad situation. The auditor might think that you're hiding revenue and reporting less on the tax return than what you've actually made. There are some tax preparers who don't know QuickBooks that well and don't really know what undeposited funds represent. Talking about 1099s, if you receive incoming 1099s to your company, and if those 1099s add up to $100,000, for an example, you can report more income than the 100000 than what you've received in the form of 1099s, but you can't report less. The IRS will catch that every time. Their computers will add up the incoming 1099s and compare it to the revenue reported on your tax return. And if your tax return shows less revenue than the 1099s added up to, you will get an automatic letter from the IRS, usually giving you 30 days to correct the books and amend the tax return. If you ignore that notice, then the chances of being fully audited go dramatically up. Another audit flag could be a company who for a few years had pretty consistent revenue and always showed a reasonable profit on that revenue. For one example, if you make $100,000 of total revenue a year and you are in New York City and your company does <clears throat> bookkeeping, for an example, 
the IRS knows the average profit that a bookkeeper in New York City should be making based on a total revenue of $100,000. And they also compute it by zip code and the classification of your business, which is on page one of your tax return. If you show $80,000 a year in profit with $100,000 of total revenue, it could actually be a flag for an audit. Enough by itself to get the company audited? Maybe not, but it would be a strike. So you want a professional team, bookkeeper and tax preparer, who understand the expected numbers that the IRS is looking for. If the numbers are too high or too low, then the tax preparer can tell you and warn you that you could have a higher chance of being audited even though these numbers will stand up to scrutiny and are correct. I had a client several years ago who was making a reasonable profit for about three years, and in year four of his business, his sales went dramatically up to about $2.5 million for the year, and he needed to buy several pieces of equipment to keep up with demand. He needed a bigger factory, which he got by forming a partnership and purchasing a building with his new partner, and then doing a lot of construction work in that building to create the new, larger factory. His profit for that year ended up being only around $15,000. If revenue is $2.5 million and the profit is only 15000 that's a very big flag for the IRS and a big chance to get audited. The tax preparer and I went over every single line item in the books for that year, and we both felt comfortable that the numbers were correct and would hold up to scrutiny. And if the client was audited in a couple of years, the IRS wouldn't find anything. The client had huge depreciation numbers on all of that equipment that he purchased for the factory and huge construction costs. And sometimes in accounting, one has to say, it is what it is. We both knew that the numbers would hold up. Lo and behold, two years later, the client was audited by the IRS. The tax preparer went to the IRS to represent the client. And after a two-day audit, they looked at literally every line item including travel schedules to make sure that all the trips were business and they matched up to business expenses and not personal, the auditor said the words that are golden in accounting audits. No change. Thanks for coming in. And the next day, it was approved by the auditor's supervisor. That client, needless to say, was very happy with his accounting team. If your company is ever audited for any reason and the IRS finds no change, the chances diminish to get audited again unless there happens to be a very large flag on your tax return. Something else to look for. If your company is a consulting company, for one example, and you travel to some of your clients either by car or air, and your company is an LLC, a sole proprietorship, or a partnership, your client should be 1099-ing you for the total amount that you're billing them, even if your travel expenses are reimbursable. For one example, you charge your client $500 for the consulting fee, but you had to rent a car for the day at $150, and your client is going to reimburse you for transportation costs, then the client should send you a 1099 for the total of $650, not the $500 for the consulting fee alone. If you are ever audited, this is something that the IRS could look for, making sure that the 1099s that you receive and match your revenue includes the reimbursements that that you charge your clients for. Some bookkeepers would take the $150 car rental incoming money and reduce the original expense in your books. In that case, the incoming 1099, which should include the reimbursed expenses since the client is deducting those expenses on their books, would not match your books in the revenue department. However, the net profit of your company would remain the same. 
I had another client recently receive a 1099 from a very large company in California for my client's management fees only. The 1099 did not include over $2 million of money that was sent to my client as reimbursements for money already spent by my client. So in that case, we counted the incoming money for the reimbursements and the original money going out both as cost of goods and labeled them very carefully. At the end of the year, they were all zero as we showed money coming in versus money going out that added up to exactly the same amount. We asked my client's company to correct the 1099 to show everything, but for some reason, they didn't want to do that. If your tax return shows that your company has not made a profit for more than three or four years, this might be a flag to be audited. The IRS would ask you what you are doing to make the company profitable. They don't really allow a company to go year after year after year without making a profit forever. In partnerships, the company might not have a profit, but the owners or partners of a company either pay themselves with W-2 payroll or pay themselves in something called guaranteed payments if they work for their own company. And those guaranteed payments are deemed as taxable income for the partners as part of their personal taxes through the K-1s. So in that case, the partners pay taxes individually, even though the partnership itself is in the red. So there are exceptions to many of these rules. As I always say, check with your accountant or your tax preparer. In this episode, I've tried to alert you as to why your book should be accurate and why you should, as a business owner, along with your bookkeeper, accountant, or tax preparer, follow the IRS rules to avoid being audited in the future. And if you are audited, if you stick to the rules that I've spoken about today, the audit will be a very easy day at the IRS office. If you have any comments or questions, please email me at bookkeepermensch at gmail. That's B-O-O-K-K-E-E-P-E-R-M-E-N-S-C-H at gmail. Or join our Facebook group called Small Business and Accounting Group. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe and stay tuned for our next episode. As always, I'm Paul Rosenblum. Thanks for listening.